everybody. Uh, we'll wait for just a couple of minutes to let you join us um, and uh, get started with tonight's uh, office hours. Rinda and I are both excited to be with you this evening to try to answer some of your questions. And uh, I mean, I think as you all know, we're all kind of on pins and needles a little bit about this whole delay in the uh, free application for federal student aid, the, uh, you know, the uh, FABSA, uh, that whole thing. I have such a tough time with that Dagon acronym. You know, I want to say it different ways and people catch me on that occasionally. But anyway, just try saying that one 10 times, you know? <laughs> you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me do this real quick. Um, I should have done this to start off with, but uh, just make sure that that's there. Um, just to help you all out tonight, um, just realize that again, there's our nice little disclaimer that you need to see. And the reason we do this every time, folks, is wait a minute, that's not the right one. Hang on a second. I'm putting up our presentation. How the heck did I did? Okay, well, I'm just going to tell you what our disclaimer is. <laughs> Basically, our disclaimer is this, folks. Um, we, um, we're not here to give you tax, legal, um, or investment advice tonight. That's not what Rinda's and my intention is. Um, on the other hand, we are here to try to answer your questions if we can. And we're going to tell you up front, by the way, if what you're asking is just way too deep for us to get to in this conversation, and we're going to then encourage you to go ahead and schedule a one-hour consultation with one of our great experts, whether that's Rinda or myself or the whole team of people that are out there. Um, but we can definitely do that. So, um, and uh, is this being recorded? Yes, it is. Um, so that'll help you out as well. But um, anyway, uh, Rinda, why don't you just take a second to introduce yourself to everybody? Hello, everybody. I'm Rinda Wilk, one of the pros at College Aid Pro. And I am happy to be here. I have a background in financial planning and financial coaching, and I made the switch over to just specializing in the college planning process, um, you know, because I felt like it was the best way for me to help uh, young adults, honestly, just get started on a sure footing out of college and moving forward with their financial lives. So I'm uh, this is my passion. I love doing this. So I'm happy to be here and hopefully we can answer a lot of your questions tonight. Awesome, Rinda. Yeah. And hey, everybody, I'm Dan Bissig. Um, so I, I've kind of had a, a, a multi-life. I started as a financial planner all the way back in 1989. And then after about uh, 18 years of doing that, suddenly discovered the world of working with families on the college side of things. And um uh, quickly went from just thinking I was going to deal with the funding side to doing everything. So I do admissions work, um, have for 17 years now, uh, but I'm excited to be with you and to, and again, even to be a, a College Aid Pro expert as well. Uh, but um, Rinda, it looks like we've got some questions here tonight. Oh, by the way, I found the disclaimer. So let me throw it up here just for kicks and giggles so that everybody can kind of see it. Uh, just that we're all, again, all on the same page on this. And uh, this time, I think I've got the right slide up. Um, so again, folks, just a, again, a reminder, if you're just joining us, that uh, we're not here to give you tax, legal, or investment advice tonight. We're just here to try to help you any way that we can on this wild and crazy process known as uh, college admissions, college financial aid, the whole thing. Um, and I, I think you probably already know this, but with College Aid Pro, our mission is to try to help make you better educated consumers of the college process so that you don't become sacrificial lambs with everything that's going on out there. All right, enough about that. Let's dive into the questions. Renda, you want to take the first one? I do. And I'm I'm glad this question came up. I think we can talk about this one because I this is the second time I'm getting this question in the past week or two. So um, this person says, well, I have a question about value of real estate. I took comparative values from Zillow um, and applied the IRS quick sale method with the 20% discount. I ended with a market value lower than the tax value and slightly lower than the purchase price. Do you see this as an issue? Should I increase the market value? That's an interesting question. And I, I mean, my only, you know, thinking on this is, what do you think, Dan, is this going to raise red flags if someone puts this? Uh, we all know that real estate prices can go up and down and the very nature of the IRS quick sell 
rule is that you are kind of deflating your market value a little bit. So, but I'm curious what you think about it, Dan. I, you know, I, I think that uh, you got to be careful with it no matter what you do. I, actually, let me put it to you this way. You have to remember that the colleges are going to tell you what they think the value is anyway, right? So, you know, you can give them your best shot as far as the number that you want to put in there um, and that you're, you're providing to them. But they're ultimately going to decide if they're going to look at some other calculator like Zillow or something else like that. And then what percentage they're going to throw on it uh, in their, their total formulas. So, um, you know, the one thing I will tell you for sure, they are definitely not going to use your tax value. I mean, that, for those of you that are out there thinking, oh, I'll just go with my tax value. Yeah, don't do that. That's a no-no, right? That's a really big, like, like Rinda was saying, that's a, that's a red flag. So be realistic about the number. Look, we know it, it's painful. We also know, though, that every one of the colleges have a different formula, potentially, as to how they handle it. I mean, we've heard them all, haven't we, Rinda? You know, with some yeah. of these schools. You know, sometimes it's a percentage of adjusted gross income. And in other cases, it's a straight out, say, 5% of the value. Um, so we try to do the best we can with the software to help you the best way we can uh, in knowing the numbers. So that's my answer. All right. And, and you know, just to cap that off, um, the schools do know that there's no one right way to do this. And like, there's not like a defined way that they are asking you to do it even. And it's kind of a just own paper number. Like it's kind of meaningless unless you're actually selling your house right now in a quick sale. So just I don't lose any sleep over it. Um, I would say one way or the other. If it's close and you makes you feel better to put a slightly higher value than what you paid for it, it's probably not going to make a huge difference either. Right. Well, we've also seen um, varying um, increases in property values across the country. You know, um, some of you folks, I don't know how you deal with it. I mean, you've moved into a place that was $250,000, say, 10 years ago, and it's a million now. I mean, my goodness, or whatever it is, crazy stuff. So, all right, next question. Uh, finally, filling out the uh, cap profile and have some questions for parent guardians pre-tax retirement contribution. Should I enter our contributed amounts or the current appreciated balances? So that particular question is asking for the pre-tax contribution. In other words, think about your pay stub or your W-2. How much did you put in there in that, you know, in, in the prior year? Uh, that's what we're really looking for there. There is a spot there for you to put your total uh, retirement amount, uh, but that pre-contribution amount is the per year amount. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. So this person is asking how to answer a CSS profile question about parent assets. It says enter the amount student, the amount students' parents contributed in 2022 to the following tax deferred pension and retirement savings plans. Is that the same question? Hu um, husband and wife both. Okay. There's a note. Husband and wife both maxing out 401k, should we add them up and enter the total? That's exactly what they should do. Sorry, I had to go back and read. Yes. Go for it. Good job, Dan. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump on top. Yeah, no, it's, it's, that's absolutely what they're, what they're asking in that particular question. I can see where there's some confusion thinking maybe it's mom or dad, right? But it's both. Right. You got okay. it. Okay. Uh, for the CSS profile, will we need to submit documents to verify what we entered, tax returns, account balances, et cetera? Great question. Here's what I will tell you. It depends on the school. Um, so what's going to happen is you're going to submit your CSS profile. And then ultimately, um, the colleges that are interested in having that kind of information uploaded to them will let you know. Um, actually, you're going to get this little nasty email thinking, oh, my gosh. In fact, one of my clients the other day, they got this The email is like, they're kind of freaking out. Like, did we forget something? I said, no, it's just part of the process. And so they needed to go up and you have to upload using iDoc. So the system's there. It actually shows you how to do it. It's actually very nice and pretty, you know, pretty straightforward directions. But uh, you've got to upload your tax return, your W-2s, and then what other uh, documents they may provide. 
Um, they rarely, in fact, I've, I've never seen it where they ask you to upload like account balances and stuff like that. They're not going to ask for your bank accounts or your mortgage or any of that kind of stuff. So don't, uh, you know, don't expect to see that. But tax returns, absolutely. All right, next question. Uh, my son has started receiving some acceptance le letters. Oh, the colors just changed on me, I guess, because of the time of day. It kind of freaked me out there. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my son has started receiving some acceptance letters, but only about half of them included info regarding merit awards. Are some schools holding off on offering merit awards because of the FAFSA delays? Any other ideas as to why some merit award offers are missing? Well, one thing is that all schools are doing do this differently and on different time schedules. So, um, you know, I would, you know, a follow up question, I think, would be, have you gotten any financial information from the school? And um, I would also be checking the admission website to see if it says what their process is in terms of um, when admission decisions come versus financial aid decisions. And if you don't find it there, you can also contact your admissions counselor and ask them. Um, so yeah, there's all kinds of different timeframes these things are gonna come, on, come in on. Perfect. All right, next question. This is an easy one. Uh, if I have two daughters in college, does each one need their own FSA ID? Uh, can I complete it uh, only once? So yes, yeah. Uh, so think of it this way. One parent needs to have the FSA ID, the custodial parent, um, and then each child needs to have their own FSA ID. Uh, that's a, a, a big deal in particular this year because in the past you could do some things uh, to maybe get into the uh, FAFSA, but those ideas, the IDs are gonna be necessary to both get in and they've always been necessary for electronically signing it at the end. But we're just going to have to kind of see this year because of this whole contributor thing, right, Rinda? It's a right. little different um, in the way that you have to be invited. The student has to invite you, the parent, to, to actually do their part. So get ready, folks. That's right. <laughs> um, okay. Can you clarify student income in the new FAFSA? My daughter worked and received $12,000 in income but did not file a tax return. Is this reported on the FAFSA? My understanding is no, but please let me know. I know there is a 9,400 or so exception, but what about the rest? Yes, there is a 9,000 something something um, income allowance for students. Um, normally, if someone earned 12,000, they would file a tax return. Um, so I'm not sure your specific circumstance, but they FAFSA will ask if you've had any income. Um, there, you know, there will be questions about income that does not show up on a tax return. Mm -hmm. So they're wanting you to fill in any blanks, basically. Yeah, that, that would kind of be considered an untaxed income spot, wouldn't it? Um, you know, as far as some of those questions that they have on there. Yeah, most likely. And again, I have to caveat this with what we were just talking about. We don't 100% know what the FAFSA is going to have on it, but I would expect there to be quite a question about, you know, asking for you to fill in with that information, the 12000 of income. Yeah, I would agree. Um, you're supposed to, look, folks, we don't want to see you behind bars. So, you know, or deal with the penalties that come with it. So, you know, be as, as, transparent and true as you can be. Um, yes, there are some places that are gray areas. Maybe that's a gray area that you're going to need to talk to your accountant about. So remember, we're not here. We are not tax preparers. So, all right. Uh, how does selling your primary home and buying another primary home affect uh, the uh, FAFSA and income on your taxes? Uh, well, as long as it's done immediately, you know, where you're selling one home and going to the other home, it shouldn't have any effect because of the circumstances there. Um, if I'm reading that correctly, anyway, I'm not sure how the income, where do you think the income would come into play? What am I missing? Um, well, if you earned more than $500,000, like let's say if you're a married couple, you sell your home and it you had gains of more than $500,000, um, you do have to recognize income on the cell. So that could be um, something that might show up. 
maybe yeah, and I guess that would show up also in the tax return for sure, wouldn't it? Right. Yeah. yeah. So that you know, and that would be pulled in automatically um, through the the thing that used to be called the data retrieval tool. Right. That information is going to be transferred automatically um, to the FAFSA if it if it was recognized income. Um, but again, that, you know, we're looking at 2022 taxes. So um, if this is something happening this year, it wouldn't hit your FAFSA, you know, for a couple more years. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually going to take this next one if it's okay with you, because it's an, it's an admissions question. I'm happy. Uh, does applying to UT Austin by priority deadline, November 1st, provide any advantage in the admissions review for an out-of-state applicant? Um, Probably not. You know, it's UT Austin as it is, is a super duper competitive school. I mean, it's super duper competitive and alone if you live in Texas and uh, as an out of state or it's even that much more difficult. It's a lot like applying to UNC Chapel Hill. It's going to all come down to the same thing that they always talk about, which is a holistic review of your application. So if a student has fantastic um you know, rigor of curriculum, uh, activities of daily or activities that they've done, you know, um, extracurriculars, their GPAs, test scores, if you're going to submit test scores and those kinds of things. I mean, it, it's all going to come down to where they fit into the applicant poll. Now, I, I'll be the first one to tell you, I always believe in you want to be at the top of the pile, not the bottom of the pile when they start, re they start reviewing applications. So personally, I'd say go for it, you know, if they can get it in earlier versus waiting. Um, I just don't know enough. I, this is where Chuck could help us out tonight. Uh, but whether November 1st is the deadline where they don't even start reviewing applications, because that's the case with some colleges where they don't even start reviewing or handing them out to their admissions reps until a specific date. Uh, that's something that would probably be worth a phone call to their admissions office just to ask them, you know, are you guys already reviewing applications? And if so, yeah, get it in. Okay. All right, so I feel like this next one, is, I'm cheating if I take it, but it's an, it's another person asked about the IDOC. So in case you didn't hear it before, most of the time when you are asked to submit um, documentation via IDOC, it's going to be tax returns, W-2s, 1099s, things like that. That was easy. <laughs> that was like my FSA question, yeah. or FSA ID. All right, next one, um, home values is only on the CSS. Um, you are correct on that. However, if a taxable event happened on the sale of a house, it would show up on the, let, let's put it this way. And Rinda mentioned this a minute ago. If it shows up on your tax return, if it's on the, the first two pages, for example, of your tax return, then it will show up on your FAFSA. So, you know, just keep that in mind. It's part of the deal. If, if it created a, a, uh, an income or a capital gain or something like that, in that particular case, then yeah, it could have an impact on both documents. Now, another impact that I'm just thinking about now is if you sold a house, pocketed a bunch of cash on the sale, and then bought another house and didn't use all that cash, then the cash you have on hand will show up on, um, on the FAFSA and the CSS. That's right, because it's considered an asset at that point in time, isn't it? Right. Yeah, and where people really don't like that one, and I've had conversations with, with folks where they say, hey, well, we sold this house, but we're waiting to buy the next house. Well, remember, it's the value of the assets on the day you complete the financial aid forms. And so, you know, if it's not going to be six months before you spend that money, you have to put it down. And man, families don't like that, but it's the truth. Yeah, technicalities. Technicalities, that's right. Um. Okay. I receive social security disability. So my son, a senior has been receiving a monthly stipend related to this. How do I report this income on the CSS profile? How about on the FAFSA? He will not receive any of this money when he is in college. Um, disability is not, I believe this is untaxed income that doesn't show up. Is, am I correct on that, Dan? You are correct on that. Yeah. Especially this year. I mean, with any of the untaxed income benefits, it's not going to show up. Um, now, ironically, I was helping one of my families today with their CSS profile and uh, dad is on, actually started receiving social security benefits in 2022. 
and his sons receive this benefit. There's a question on there that asks if a student has received um, social security benefits. And so you actually do put it down there for the child that you're completing the CSS profile for. Let's say it was $3,800 or whatever it might be, that dollar amount you would actually put in there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, are in-kind contributions payments to help with rent, et cetera, from, any, from another household payment the count as a as student income are in kind contributions. Tell me what this one's about, Rinda. Maybe I'm not reading it correctly. Okay, so uh, let's say the parent has someone else living in the household that's paying utilities or part of the rent. Does this count as student income? I think that's what it's saying. Yeah, can you clarify that a little bit better okay. for us? We're, we're trying to read, we want to make sure we're not reading something into what you're asking. So maybe maybe come back to us with more details on that, okay? Okay, using CAP. The need-based aid that the software shows is much higher than what the various college need-based aid estimates are using, are using their EFC calculators. Why is that? I don't want false hope. So what to think? Um, I'm also having trouble processing that. Okay, so the need-based aid that the software shows. Oh, are you are you comparing my cap to the net price calculators? Do you think that's what I think they're doing, Rinda? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an issue because the net, you know. For whatever reason, a lot of schools don't keep up with their net price calculators. They're either, they either have not enough questions to come up with a good net price for you, or they don't necessarily update them. In this case, um, so you're saying my cap is predicting more need-based aid than the net price calculator. I'm trying to think what would be a reason for that? Well, number one, wouldn't you agree they need to make sure that they're putting exactly the same numbers into both calculators? Yeah. Um, don't forget again that we ask some additional detailed questions um, that maybe the other one doesn't um, or vice versa. I mean, there could be something there that we don't know about. Or um, it could be, you know, I was just thinking about it. Um, they might not have switched over to the new FAFSA methodology. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that families used to get credit for, like having two kids in school at once, might still be baked into the net price calculator um, when they shouldn't be. Yeah, that's true. There's all kinds of things that can make the numbers different. Right. And, and folks, that's the thing that you have to realize. There's so many other moving parts behind the scenes that are now coming to play. Depends on the circumstances with you, you know, as far as... Um, what your family dynamics are and all that kind of stuff that could have an impact on it. Um, so, you know, what I will tell you that our data scientists, our team of people, they're on top of this all the time, trying to do everything they can to make sure that the information is up to date. It is still a projection. Let's be very clear about that. It is not perfect. Don't expect it to be because of the fact that we're using the information that's being provided to us through the uh, FAFSA, as well as all the different calculations and, you know, the, because we do too. I mean, they go out and they run net price calculators too to try to keep up with things. Uh, but I will tell you that um, our families that, that use the software come back to us all the time and, you know, they, they thank us for how close they are, you know, within hundreds of dollars as far as what those numbers are. So, um, you know, just um, hopefully, it, you know, you're in a situation where what you're seeing is exactly what you'll receive, but um, it, you just proceed with caution. Um, this is a case where, you know, we we talk about safety schools from an academic standpoint, but having some financial safety schools is a good idea yeah. on, on your list. That's a great, great, great point. Yeah. Um, is this one you or me? Oh, I'll take it. Uh, what? <laughs> uh, do you recommend FAFSA automatic tax info transfer or manual entry? I'm happy to take this one because this is an easy one now. Um, you don't really have a choice anymore, unfortunately. In the past, you could um, do either enter manually or 
allow the system to fill the numbers in for you. Now, if you don't allow the system to fill in the numbers, you basically can't submit the FAFSA. So that's a big change. Mm -hmm. That's a big change. Yeah, it's really, again, it's interesting because this whole how they're going to handle families who have unique situations, you know, and, and we know that you're out there and they do too. We, you know, we're just going to have to see how it all shakes out. Yeah, good point. All right, let's see what we've got here. California State College is an example of CSU. Parent income information question, okay? Parents untaxed income and benefits for 2022. Uh, this is the income not reported on your parents' federal tax return. Does that mean I have to include a 403B contribution listed on the W-2 item 12? Um, your 403B should be, if it's, in, if it's on your W-2, it actually is... I mean, it's item 12A through 12D, and it's big letters, D, E, F, G, H, S, and I don't know, or something like that. But anyway, there's specific letters that you only use when you're putting that information in. So, um, but a 403B should fall into that same category. It should be one of those large letters. Um, it's not like DD. DD, for example, is um, employer provided um, payments to your health insurance um, and things like that. So, um, follow the directions. I mean, you should be able to very clearly see exactly what they're looking for. Just click the question mark button on there and that'll take care of you. Yep. Okay. So there's a question in the CSS, enter the amount parents contributed in 2022 to the following, a health savings account, HSA. Is that the amount in the W2 line 12 code W? I now have that to one look I, it up every time. Do you have to look them up? I would look it up. Yeah, if you could look it up, I'd appreciate it because I just don't remember. I, I ask people all the time about their HSAs and so few people say, yeah, I've got one. Um, so Rindam will get you an answer here in just a second. The financial coach in me wants to just interject here. This is the best, the, oh, we're not supposed to give tax advice. HSAs are the best thing going when it comes to tax advantages. I'll just say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm I'm looking it up. If you want okay, to take while you're doing that, I'll go to the next question. Okay. For this question on the Common App, indicate the number of community programs or organizations that have provided you with free assistance in your application process. Here are my questions: Are there any advantages or disadvantages of listing such community-based organizations? Do you think the application will be judged more strictly since the understanding is that the student received help? You know what? I got to tell you something. If you're applying to colleges, your kids applying to colleges and they're going to hold that against your student, then why are they applying to that college? I mean, look, let's be real. If they're going to truly hold that against your students, um, it wouldn't be the right college for my kids. And so, um, no, it should not be held against your students. The, the question's on there to help the school understand what's going on. Um, and quite frankly, I think that it's really the school's desperation to try to say, hey, we're here to try to help. You know, we're here to help students that maybe have financial need, that have other, you know, um, uh, requirements. So go for it. I mean, there's really no reason. If you truly have received those kinds of programs or those kinds of, of opportunities, put them down. Don't be afraid to put that kind of information down. Okay. I promise you, it will not and should not affect your students' admission or missability at all. Okay. Shall I keep going? Or All right. Back? So code W. Um... Oh, wait a minute. Hang on a second. Hey, gang, please put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. We're not going to look at the chat. So if, don't take the time to put it in the chat. We won't be looking at it. All right. Sorry. Yeah. So the question was if code W was the HSA. H yeah. HSA. Code W is only what your employer put in there. Mm. Um, so... I'm looking for the right code for the one that tells what you put in there and I haven't found it yet. So um, I, you know what I'm going to do though? So I don't have to keep looking through this. I'm going to put a link to this article. Beautiful. All right. Has all of the codes in it. This will help everybody. I don't multitask very well and I don't want you to have to answer all the questions. <laughs> Thanks, Renda. While she's doing that, I will take this next one. Is it beneficial to submit the CSS profile early, earlier than November the 1st, if applying regular decision? Um, it doesn't hurt. 
listen, we're we're all about doing the CSS profile and getting it done and off your to-do list, folks. There's nothing holding you back right now. Go get it done. Get it turned in. Okay. So I put the link in the chat um, that has all the box 12 codes and what they are. So if you if anybody looks that wants to look at it, feel free. Um, okay, I think this is the right one uh, for estimated 2023 income tax payments. Should we just enter the net after our estimated tax payments? Or should we go ahead and pay our estimated tax now and enter our actual cash balances that are left? That is, should we go ahead and pay taxes now? We will likely have to pay a fair amount. Okay, I think if I'm reading this correctly, you're confusing putting what your estimated taxes are expected to be for 2023 and what you've actually filed for estimated taxes. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, that's what I'm reading too. So I think I agree with you. The bottom line is, while you know they're expecting you to put in there a projection of your 2023 income and the total amount of taxes that you expect to pay for 2023 as well so that's what they're looking for uh based on you know what your taxable situation is and there's a reason for that by the way folks the reason you want to put the actual amount of taxes that you pay in is because they're going to give you credit for that they reduce it off your income don't they Rinda? yep and, you know, I look, I'm looking in, and so you were, this person was asking, and should I pay the taxes now? It's not going to matter for that question when you pay the taxes, but how that, it could help you to pay the taxes now if having lower assets would meaningfully reduce your student aid index because you'd have less cash on hand. Hmm. Yeah, uh, but if you're coming from a business, then there's some, yeah, I would have to know more to, to, say that for sure but in in general you know less cash on hand means a lower student aid index in, in most cases uh let's see i plan to take a snapshot of my savings and checking account on the day i submit my css profile will the college ask for such information no they won't they're not going to ask you to provide any proof of that it's again the honor system as far as where you're at okay so we got a little bit more information about the question. We asked for more information. The student that had made 12,000 and this person is saying that it's under the standard deduction. Um, the standard deduction is different for if the student is um, a dependent than it is if they're an independent. So I, I don't want to get into that question because that's strictly a tax filing question anyway. Um, the bottom line is though, most likely the, you know, there will be a question on the FAFSA and definitely on the CSS, they would ask if if you've earned any, you know, any additional income that's not going to show up on your tax returns. All right. Uh, let's see here. How do you explain the significant difference one sees between the projected cost of colleges on the College A Pro database versus the individual college's net price calculators? Well, I think we kind of already alluded to this. You know, when, when we're using, with our data, just so you know, in fact, pretty recently, there was a major upload uh, or updating that took place to um, our data. And that's where our data scientists, they go out and they get the most up-to-date information from the, the different schools. Um, you know, you're saying you've seen differences of 20 to 30,000. That's almost sounds like a conversation that you'd have with one of us to see what's going on. It could be the information that's been input on both the net price calculator versus our database. Again, like Rinda said a few minutes ago, it's possible that net price calculator has not been updated to reflect the changes that have gone into the uh, FASA based on the uh, FASA Simpl Simplification Act. Um, and so that could really be part of the deal. It also could be that that calculator is taking the consideration, because we don't know this about you, are there multiple students in college at the same time? That still could be showing that, you know, uh, versus the, uh, the other way around. So I think there's more to that that's, that's, than what's going on there, but uh, it might be worth a review. You know, if you want to send something into support at uh, collegeaidpro.com, 
and um, you know, just mention your name, then they can pull it up and do some looking into that for you if you'd like. But the problem is we, of course, don't see the numbers on the enterprise calculator, you know, so that that would we'd be at a disadvantage on that one. Okay. Um, you know, the someone I'm gonna skip one of these comments just because I think it's something we covered already. And then the next one, my my Q and A keeps jumping around. So I'm that's happy. me. Sorry, I'm cleaning it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and the next one is about submitting SAT scores. You want to take that one? I'll be happy to. So, uh, if my daughter wants to submit SAT scores for some schools and not for others. Um, and all are due on November 1st, how can she do that in the Common App? Well, it's, actually, it's very simple. What I would suggest to you is I would carve out the colleges that you want to see her scores and um, go ahead and send those off first and then go back in. And, you know, because I've actually had families ask this, but, you know, because it's self-reported scores that are in there in the essay or in the uh, testing section of the Common App, uh, but you can always go in and, and just remove the SAT scores, you could continue to include AP exams if you want to, um, but there's nothing wrong with sending it to some schools and not to others. Um, just be prepared for, for that list. The other thing I will tell you is don't forget you can also, and you should, check to see if the school expects to see our official scores. And if you're going to do official scores, you go to the college board website, and then you can order those test scores to be sent directly to the colleges on the student's behalf. Um, but you definitely want to be on top of that because if colleges expect to see those official scores, it really comes down to they may expect to receive them by November the 1st, you know, so make sure that you do your homework on that. Don't assume anything because we don't want you to, to pay the price. That's right. Okay. okay. Um, on the CSS, it asks what parents plan to pay. Is there a rule of thumb as to how you should answer this? This is one of the hardest questions I think for families to get a hold of. Um, there are some different ways to think about it. Number one, don't put a number that's higher than what you you actually can pay. That's not going to help you. Um, another thing, uh, a point that you know, someone from our team mentioned to me this past week when we were talking about this question is if. Um, if your student or maybe a younger sibling is in private school, uh, high school or middle school, um, and you list the cost of their private school, and then you put a smaller number than that on what you plan to pay, that's just not a good look <laughs> to say, oh, I've been paying 50,000 a year for private high school, but I'm only willing to pay 30,000 for college. That's not probably a good idea. Um, some other rules of thumb, uh, some people will take their, you know, if you have a 529 balance, I'll take that and divide by four. I've heard that. Um, so there's some different ways to look at that number, but um, try to be as realistic with it as possible. And don't overstate it either. Um, I mean, I, I guess I kind of said that in the beginning, you know, don't put more than you can pay. Yeah, again, because you can't unsee what you've seen, those admissions people for, or those uh, financial aid people for sure. Yeah, and I've even, um, somebody recently said, hey, you know, uh, a, a realistic number might be 10% uh, of your AGI, for example, you know, that that could be a number that uh, gets put down there. So uh, it's whatever you feel comfortable with, just like, like Rinda said, don't overdo it. Um, okay, uh, next one here. My husband and I have a 529 for each of our two sons, a senior and a sophomore. Do we have to include the 529 assets for the senior and the parents, guardians, non-retirement savings investments? And if so, do we have to put the sophomores 529 assets as well? So um, I assume we're talking here again about the CSS profile. Um, in that particular case, um, and that, well, number one, you have to know in, whether it's the, the, the um, CSS profile or the uh, FAFSA. The FAFSA moving forward, it only will be the amount for your senior. You're going to put that down, and that will indeed be the parent's asset because even though the student is the beneficiary of that 529 plan, it's it's mom and dad's money. So you know you definitely want to do that. On the CSS profile, uh, I again follow that same philosophy. You know, is that it it should be just the, um, the that student's 529 plan money that's put down in there. Um, now there is a question on the CS that also asks if, if there are other people participating and paying for college. That's not in the 
uh, the FASVA specifically. But any other thoughts on that, Rinda? Um, just that I think I have seen a questionless CSS that alludes to accounts, basically sibling accounts. And so um, you may see a question about that on the CSS where they're expecting you to put include the siblings 529 balance. One thing I'm also learning is that not all questions, not everyone filling out the CSS gets the exact same questions. I mean, that's obvious in some cases, like, you know, two household families versus one household and stuff like that. But um, so some of these things, you know, one person may see a question about that and the next person may not. Um, but yeah, be prepared to answer it on the CSS, I think. Okay, it's my turn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm a joint account holder in a savings account. Someone else is the primary account holder. The primary account holder will be responsible for reporting 1099 INT. Do I have to report the balance of such an account on the FAFSA? I mean, the primary owner is someone else, not me. Thank you. I mean, technically you have access to that money. And so I, I think the correct thing would be to report half of it is that your understanding that's thing? what i'm thinking too 50 percent of it you may not have to be the owner i mean you're not the owner but you're on the account if you've got access to the money yeah i would think 50 percent is what you've got to put down okay all right next one uh this is another easy one uh what do you recommend on providing the parent social security number in the css profile so um we believe that you shouldn't put down anything that's not required and by the way, the parent social security number is one of those questions that is not required. However, remember we talked about earlier, if you were on the call, um, that um, the CSS profile colleges may come back and request a copy of your tax return. Well, lo and behold, guess what they're going to get when they ask for your tax return? They're going to get your social security number in there. So, uh, you know, we're of the opinion, again, don't put it down if you don't have to. Do not answer those non-required questions but just be prepared for the fact that they're going to probably get what they want anyway, at least in that case. Yeah. Okay. When my father died and he left, I'm assuming that means he left money in my name that is intended for my sister and me evenly. Over the years, I divided the money into two separate accounts. I don't spend her half and throughout the years have gifted her maximum gift amount though not consistently. When we fill out FAFSA or CSS, it will show a, up as our assets, but is there a way for me to communicate this information so that they may, may discount this amount? Um, it, it is a special circumstance. Um, I don't know that I would put it in the special circumstances section. I would hold it and bring it to them in an appeal, most likely, because I would definitely want to make sure that someone was paying attention to that. Um, if you have, yeah, I mean, hopefully you have some documentation, a will basically that shows that. Um, do you have any other thoughts on that one, Dan? I really don't. I mean, I, I think, again, it, it's all about documentation, documentation, documentation. Yeah. You know, if you can prove it to them about the, the circumstances that are going on there, then they should be willing to, you know, give you some some credit for that. All right. Yeah. Uh, do competitive colleges favor applicants that don't participate in dual enrollment? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, look, here's the deal. You know, a dual enrollment, of course, means is where a student has had the opportunity to take either classes internally at their high school taught by a, a you know a master's level teacher who is in affiliation with a local college or university or they actually go out and they do a course at a, a local college it could be a community college or somebody else that's close by um the, the question really is will you get credit for that that's the difference because the competitive colleges actually might like the fact that you've you know, been doing these college level classes. It, heck, it shows that you're college ready. To me, that's a big deal. Um, I, you got to know I'm a huge fan of dual enrollment. Um, I personally think that um, 
Uh, and I can tell you, my daughter would tell you the same thing. You know, years ago, she, you know, she uh, talked to us after graduating from college. She said, I wish I'd known about dual enrollment years before um, so that I could have focused on that. Now, granted, colleges absolutely love AP and IB. I mean, International Baccalaureate Advanced Placement, they do. But whether you're going to get credit or not, part of the story, but I do think that it still adds to the resume of accomplishments of a student if they've done really well in those dual enrollment classes. So that's my opinion. I do think, though, that, you know, that uh, you also need to be looking at schools back to what Rinda said earlier, you know, that, that you got to put some other schools on the list that maybe are going to reward your student for all their hard work and maybe let them get done in three years instead of four years because they've got, you know, an entire freshman year of courses that they've gotten credit for. So just you know, plan accordingly. I hate to tell you, but the next one is an admissions question. So, oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. The NCSS question: How much can you contribute? Is that the one? No. Oh, did I skip one? Yeah. Sorry about that. You're right. I will take that. Well, we just finished talking about that, so I'm thinking that might have been typed earlier. But um, yeah, that could be. How much, so another person talking about that question, how much um, should you, you contribute? Um, you can contribute. That's so. right. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. then I will take this one. So this is more of an admissions question and perhaps a merit aid question as well. What is the appropriate amount of demonstrated interest touch points for a college that indicates they don't consider level of applicants interest in their process? Okay. So here's the deal. Um, everybody should go to a website called um, collegedata.com. And the reason you do is because in collegedata.com, there's this little chart that pops up if you, if you go into the admissions area that'll show what's important to colleges. You know, do they care about rigor? Do they care about the letters of recommendation? Do they care about um, whether you made a visit to the school, meaning the demonstrated interest, you know? Um, that's what I would use if I were you, because it really does a nice job of giving that kind of information to you. And um, it, it really can help you. It's either do that or call up the admissions office and ask them, you know. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you that I advise my students all the time that they need to make the admissions people at the colleges that they're applying to their friends. And that every single college needs to be their number one college. Whether it is or not, it doesn't matter. It needs to be their number one. And so the idea there is that um, if they're reaching out to them, if they're making a connection with them, then if that person, that admissions representative, then needs to go and defend that student in front of the admissions committee, then maybe there's a relationship there of some sorts. They, they can think about that student and, and they can talk about all the positive accolades about the student and why they should admit them. So definitely have your students make those connections. It sure can't hurt. Um, especially in those cases when it comes down to a, a competitive situation where they're comparing two students against each other. All right. So back to selling your home. Uh, this person is just wanting some clarification. I think the gain from selling your home will show its income, whether you use it to buy another house or not. So back years and years ago, it used to be that you had to re- uh, reinvest the proceeds from selling one home into another home so that you didn't have to recognize a gain on your tax return. That is no longer the case. So it has, whether or not you have to recognize income when you sell a home has nothing to do with whether you reinvest the money into another home or not. It has everything to do with your basis in that home. So like how much did you pay for the home versus how much you sell it for? And then there are some allowances so um, and some requirements. I don't want to get into all the details because this is really a tax thing, but you, you there's either a $250,000 or $500,000 allowance that you can qualify for in some cases. And so as long as you gained less than those, that amount, whichever one applies to you, whether you're single or married, um, it, you can basically shelter your gain from taxes. I'm not describing this really great, but yeah, it's basically has to do with that allowance, whether or not you have to um, report the gain on your tax return. And remember, if it's sitting in your account, you must report it. As so, an asset. Yeah. As an asset. Yeah. 
All right, next one. My daughter has worked in 2022 and 2023 in the CSS profile when they ask expected income from 2024. Is that okay to say zero? It's probably she won't be working. Yeah, it's absolutely okay to put zero there. Just know this, um, whether you like it or not, the CSS profile colleges have an expectation that your student is going to participate in paying for their education. Um, I, I mean, the ranges or the numbers can vary, but it's about $2,700 per se, 26 to $2,700 per year. So, I mean, they're basically gonna factor that in when they're doing their calculations. So just know that that's part of it. And by the way, our software does that too. It'll show you that number uh, because it's trying to, you know, help you understand what's the overall student aid index amount that they're going to expect. All right. So got a little clarification on the question about um, whether it made sense to go ahead and pay estimated taxes in 2023 before submitting the CSS. Um, or So basically your assets are your assets are your assets as of the day you hit submit on the CSS profile and later on the FAFSA. So if the money's in your account, it's supposed to be reported as an asset. If the money's not sitting in your account, then it's not reported as an asset. That's the, that's the long and short of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by the way, your accountant may suggest that you go ahead and make that payment before the end of the year anyway to get it off the books, you know? So, um, Talk to them. Something tells me you're working with somebody uh, doing that, helping you with it, hopefully. And that'll definitely be a good thing. Um, if we anticipate based on my cap, not qualifying for need-based federal aid, is there any scenario where we should avoid checking the box? I intend to apply for need-based financial aid. Would it give any advantage to signal that we won't apply for fi uh, financial federal financial aid? Uh, we've always heard that we should fill out the uh, FAFSA and apply for need-based aid. Um, yes, you have. I mean, we talk about it all the time, um, that we we truly believe that you should have a backup plan for the what ifs in life. And, and I've mentioned this before in other office hours. In 17 years of practicing, I've had parents die, become disabled, lose their jobs, even lose their businesses. And those are catastrophic events that can have a huge impact on college funding. Um, and so, yeah, you've got to be careful about that. Now, back to your question here. Um, People ask this question all the time. And I'm sure they've asked you this too. Um, should I or shouldn't I do it? Um, there is one area that you might have to be cautionary about, which is if a school is need aware in admissions. And that's where, and you can Google this. You can go Google the schools that your student is looking at to see if they're need aware. Are they need aware for US citizens or just international students or both or neither? Um, if they're need aware, what that means is that they will take into consideration your putting down that you're qualifying for federal financial aid uh, or, well, a financial aid in general. Sorry, it's not just federal um, when it comes to the admissions decisions. So just be aware of that. Um, you know, walk into it with your eyes wide open so that you don't get any surprises. But also don't put yourself in jeopardy, you know, of thinking, oh, we're just going to take a shot at this and see if they're going to give the student, you know, give our son or daughter money. Um, if you can't afford the school at the beginning, don't expect that they're suddenly going to throw a whole bunch of money at you. Um, that's why you should really run the numbers, which you've obviously done. Thank you for doing that, by the way, so that you have a sense going into it about how realistic things look. But if your SAI amount is more than you can afford, then don't put yourself into jeopardy of applying to schools that are out of your budget uh, because they're not going to just miraculously do things. Okay, so this next question is an admissions question. Um, will colleges accept official SAT scores before students send college application or is it necessary to send the application first? I'm going to say, I don't think the order matters that much. It doesn't. No, you're absolutely right, Rinda. Yeah. You, yeah, there you go. Yeah, no, it really doesn't. I mean, there's no reason why you can't go ahead and send those SAT scores. Kind of the way I describe it is this. Think about it, th that every single college that your student is applying to kind of has a folder that they open up, an electronic folder for the student. And they're going to start filling that folder with like your test scores and your Common App and your letters of recommendation and your transcripts and all those pieces of the puzzle. Once they've got everything, then they, of course, go ahead and process the application. So you're you're right on. Anytime, go ahead and go for it. 
better to get them there early than for them not to arrive in time. Okay, uh, okay. next one's me. Uh, Fez was doing away with reporting 529s and grandparents' names. That is correct. Um, and actually, it was it never was there before. What happened was when a distribution took place from a 529 plan owned by a grandparent, it was treated as income to the child, which really stunk, okay, for all kinds of reasons. But now it doesn't count at all. Um, so then you're going on, does CSS ask about 529 owned, uh, 529s owned by grandparents? Uh, does it account for grandparent 529s the same as parent as the parents 529s? So there is a question on the CSS profile that asks if anybody else is going to be helping to contribute to the education. It does not have a drop down menu in there that talks about 529 plans or grandparent owned 529 plans or any of that kind of stuff. Again, it's supposed to be on the honor system that what you're doing is you're disclosing if there are other funds, whether it's aunts or uncles or grandparents that are going to contribute to the college expenses. So, um, I mean, like I said, there's nothing, there is nothing on there. There's no drop down that says, you know, here's an example. It's really kind of strange. As a matter of fact, there's nothing that you click and it just spreads it all out and says, here's what we want to see. So, um, you know, should you disclose it? Yeah. I mean, you, you should. Right, Rinda? So I can hear some people in my head saying, well, it's not a sure thing. It's not your money. And the uh, the person who owns those account could do whatever they want to with that money. So um, technically, I'm not, I'm not honestly sure what the technical answer is for that. But um, yeah, the head scratcher. Mm-hmm. That's a head scratcher. Stay tuned. Yep. Um, so going back one, does the FAFSA or CSS need to be applied for each year? Yep. Um, I mean, if you're if you are getting any sort of need-based financial aid, or if you're taking um federal student loans, um, then you definitely have to fill out your financial aid forms each year. And basically, need-based aid is only good for one year. So you kind of have to re-qualify for that every single year. Um, so most people are going to end up filling it out every year. Um, somebody was asking for the name of that website that I was mentioning, and I'm actually typing that into um, uh, the chat box for everybody, okay? Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. I see that. Uh, here's another common app question. I'm going to read it for you while you do that, Dan. <laughs> Is it advisable to self-report AP scores in the common app, but actually pay to have the SAT scores sent to the colleges, Dan? Um, yeah. I mean, sure it is. Uh, number one, self-reporting the AP scores Kind of the way I look at AP, you don't want to spend a dime on sending AP scores to any of the colleges until you actually get to the final college that the student's going to. And then you spend the money to do it because let's not forget that a lot of times seniors are going to be taking AP exams in the uh, in May, you know, of 2024, um, and, you know, after they've already been admitted to colleges. So I say wait on those for sure. And yeah, it, it, remember, again, you've got to check. Some colleges will let you just self-report those SAT scores. Uh, but in other cases, they expect you to not only self-report, but also pay to have those scores sent to them. Some colleges are even wild and crazy, like Georgetown University, which says, send us all of your SAT scores. So that can start adding up, folks, depending upon how many times your student has taken that test. All right. So... Um, regarding the question about other people contributing to the student's education, what if an aunt or uncle has contributed to the parent-owned 529? Well, um, you don't need to do anything in a case like that because you're already reporting the value of the parent-owned 529 as the parent asset. So it's already accounted for. Perfect. Uh, do you subtract a HELOC balance from your home equity? Yes, you do. Uh, if, yeah, I mean, I assume you're saying that you've, if you've spent the money, yes, 
you know, if you've got a home equity line of credit just sitting out there that you have not spent, then no, you don't because it's still part of the equity of your house. It, it's going to count against you one way or the other. The only way that it, it, it helps you is if you've actually spent the money that's in your HELOC. Does that make sense? In other words, if, if the HELOC's been spent for something, maybe you bought a car with part of your home equity line of credit. Um, so it was 50000 now it's $20,000. Yes, you subtract that $30,000 off the home equity line of, or off your home equity before you put it down. Yep. Um, okay. Can we use the IRS quick sell for home value? If so, anyone have the URL for that? Can't seem to find it. So the quick sell... I'm not sure what you mean by the URL. It's a it's just a rule that says you can reduce the fair market value by 20% um, to come up with the quick sell value. Do you know what they're talking about as terms of a URL, Dan? I think they're looking for the URL for the IRS quick sale. I mean, what what that link is to to do the um, IRS quick sale calculation. That's oh. what I, that's what they're looking for. Um, you know what, uh, why don't you look for that if you don't mind? And I'll take the next question since it's, oh gosh, do, do you realize it's 801? Uh, really listen, not? so we're, we're down to like, maybe we're going to take maybe two or three more questions, folks. So please don't add any more to the list because um, we're already past our hour. Uh, if a school is need aware in its admissions, does that mean they are also aware in the amount of the need? In other words, uh, they see the results from the uh, FAFSA and um, have awareness of the level of need. Um, yeah, I mean, what it means is that the financial aid office and, and the admissions office are probably communicating about that in some way, because um, you have to remember that, that all comes down to the endowment funds uh, that they have at the school. Now, if you're a school of the size of Harvard with billions of dollars in their endowment fund, they should be able to help you fill that, which is why, by the way, they've got what's called the Harvard Promise, um, you know, that comes into play there. So um, why does a HELOC line count against you? Um, it counts against you again, as I said, that if, you know, or we said that if you have not spent the money, if, if you've got the line of credit, but you haven't used it, then it's no different than having the money in the equity of your house. That's what we're talking about there. Um, so. Sorry, I, I can't put my fingers on the calculator. Okay. So. Well, so do us a favor, folks. In that case, why don't you reach in, uh, send support at uh, collegeaidpro.com. So again, support at collegeaidpro.com. I'll type it in here real quick for you. Um, and feel free to um, ask them that question. Um, they can probably provide that for you. We're just, let's see here. All right, there you go. Support at collegeaidpro.com. Hey, we want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, this has been awesome. We hope that you've learned a little bit. Don't forget to, to reach out to your tax professionals, your, your financial professionals, and that if you've got the MyCap program, you can always schedule a one-hour consultation with one of our um, great experts where they can go into more detail to try to help you, um, especially if you got really complicated. I mean, sometimes some, some of the things you guys were asking tonight were pretty deep, folks. I'm not going to lie to you, and, and tax-related details. Um, you know, but we hope that you've learned a little bit, that you're a little farther ahead than you were before. And most importantly, that you are getting those financial aid forms and those applications submitted as soon as possible so that you're at the top of the pile, not the bottom of the pile when they're handing out the money. So, uh, Brenda, great uh, doing this with you tonight. Thank you, folks. We'll see you in uh, two weeks. Everybody take care. And everybody.